This is Rick Malone for the San Francisco Symphony. Many a love affair with the music of Gustav Mahler has begun in the sunshine of the Fourth Symphony. Even he felt that after his audacious and controversial First Symphony, and then the earth and heaven shattering Second and Third, the transparency, friendliness, and relative shortness of the Fourth might win him some new friends. Unfortunately, the opposite was true. It was those very qualities that enraged the first audiences in 1901. How dare the composer of the Resurrection Symphony suddenly develop charm and naivete? And what were those sounds? Sleigh bells? And even worse, flutes imitating sleigh bells? This could not be a Mahler symphony. Well, today, we can see a little more clearly that, in fact, he was writing a Mahler symphony, with all of his trademarks but one— Rather than swinging back and forth between the light and dark aspects of his musical personality, this time he focused almost exclusively on the sunny side. Mahler actually wrote his fourth symphony in reverse. In 1892, he'd finished a song called Das Himmlische Leben, Life in Heaven. The text was from a book called Des Knaben Wunderhorn, The Boy's Magic Horn, a collection of German folk poetry that had been liberally adapted and paraphrased by Clemens Brentano and Achim von Arnhem just after 1800. Mahler used poems from this collection in several of his works, including a whole cycle of songs. In fact, Mahler had intended this particular song to be the finale of his third symphony, which is why the third seems to quote the fourth in several places. He ended up using Life in Heaven as the finale of the Fourth Symphony, and he had to plan the symphony so that the song would appear to be the logical outcome and conclusion of what he had actually composed eight years later. It was important to him that listeners clearly understand how the first three movements all point toward and are resolved in the finale. The symphony starts with the very elements that annoyed those first audiences so much. The bells, the flutes, and a violin tune that sounds so much like a folk song that it's hard to believe Mahler wrote it. In fact, the entire exposition is a conversation. The sociologist and musicologist Theodore Adorno called what Mahler did turning cliché into event. Ideas lead to many different conclusions and can be ordered in many ways. Mahler is taking his cue here from Haydn's London symphonies and late string quartets. He's also playing with his orchestration and scoring in unusual ways, as if he's turning a musical kaleidoscope. He can write brilliant and dramatic passages for the entire orchestra, but he hardly ever does. What he likes better is to have the conversation pass rapidly and wittily from instrument to instrument, section to section. and combining textures and colors as much as combining themes.
The first movement is structured like Haydn too, in classical sonata form, and comes to a big finish in one of the few instances in which Mahler does use the full orchestra. Mahler generally disliked giving subtitles to individual movements of his symphonies. He wrote that he refused to betray them to the rabble of critics and listeners who would then subject them to their banal misunderstandings. The scherzo of this symphony, though, does have a name. Freund Hein spielt auf, Death Strikes Up. Freund Hein, or Friend Hal, is a German fairy tale boogeyman whose name is most often a euphemism for death. Mahler's wife Alma later wrote that the composer was under the spell of the self-portrait by Arnold Birkelin, in which death fiddles into the painter's ear while the latter sits entranced, end quote. The first violinist here uses an instrument tuned a whole tone high to make it sound harsher, and the score says to make it sound like a country instrument and to enter very aggressively. There are two gentle trios. The conductor, Willem Mengelberg, took detailed notes at Mahler's 1904 rehearsals, and at this point he wrote into his score, here he leads us into a lovely landscape. Once again, the solos pass back and forth in conversation. But death has the final word. Mahler considered the Adagio to be his finest slow movement. It's a set of soft and gradually unfolding variations. It's full of heart-rending melodies, but the constant feature, almost the refrain, is this tolling of the basses, softly under even softer violas and cellos. The variations are interrupted twice by a minor key lament. As they become shorter, more diverse in character, and more given to abrupt changes in outlook. The dramatic episodes gradually accelerate. pulled more and more in the direction of E major. The movement began in G, but E finally asserts itself dramatically in a blaze of sound.
Mahler brings us almost back to G with a serene and quiet benediction. But when the finale finally emerges almost from nothing, it is in E. And even though Mahler has thoroughly prepared us for this moment, he makes it sound new, as if we've never heard it before. He wants us to understand that we're now in heaven. This is the song from Des Knaben Wunderhorn, Heaven is Hung with Violins. It's a child's view of heaven, full of singing and dancing, good food and drink, where angelic voices gladden our senses. St. Peter, St. Luke, St. Martha, St. Ursula, and St. Cecilia are all mentioned, and every time the music takes a turn to the medieval. Those chords are actually pre-echoed in the third symphony, and they have a double meaning for Mahler. Here, they are associated with details about this sweet but slightly hedonistic picture of heaven, but in the third symphony, they signal the bitterness and shame at having transgressed the Ten Commandments and with the plea to God for forgiveness. Each time here, they're followed by a parody of the opening of the first movement. as if to highlight the distinction. And just as the symphony began with bells, it ends with them. But this time, it's a sound that Mahler discovered, deep, single tones of the harp. The references that Mahler makes between his pieces remind us of how much all of his work is one work, exploring the strange new worlds in the great musical universe which he opened up. The initial negative reaction to Mahler's fourth may seem strange to us today, but sometimes it's hard to imagine that even the most forbidding planet can actually be a slice of heaven. This is Rick Malone for the San Francisco Symphony.